fourth floor of the Museum of Modern Art, and we're standing in front of Jackson Pollock's, one of his great seminal signature works, a painting called 131, 1950. That's a lot of numbers. It's, it's, you know, he made a real decision. Is it like Chopin, you know, Nocturne number 22? It's exactly what it is. He, he had titles, and actually he would occasionally title again, or sometimes accept the titles that his friends developed for a painting after it was finished. But scholars have thought that Pollock numbered because he wanted not to close down meaning. He wanted the meaning to remain open, and that the system that was used by composers did that. Oh, that makes sense. So there, he didn't want any text associated with this image. Right. right? Except something very open-ended. So The same I'm, year that he produced this, in fact, um, at the same time he produced this, he produced Autumn Rhythm, which hangs up at the mat. Which does have a name. It does have a name, and, you know, people look for, you know, the colors of fall. They right. look for... Or the rhythm. Yeah, exactly. Right. And they wonder what that is. Well, it's a series of associations. A minute ago, when we walked into the room, you said that you could tell that it was when it was upside down, which I don't think many people could do. So that would mean that there is something very intentional about the drips and their direction and the form that this image takes that I think is probably lost on most viewers. Yeah, that's a really interesting, I think, complicated set of issues because when we think of Pollock's drip paintings, we, I think, quite rightfully think of a kind of improvisation. And these paintings are a kind of improvisation. But like when, a jazz musician yeah. going off on a riff. Right, exactly. But that same jazz musician probably knows how to control a saxophone brilliantly. And Pollock, I think, really understood how to control the painting in these incredibly unique ways. It's interesting that we don't want to allow him that control. We love the idea of the artist as the idiot savant. We want it with Van Gogh. We want it with everybody. These people who are somehow brilliant in this very narrow way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but Pollock was very sophisticated visually and really understood, I think, what he was up to. And so how's top and bottom work here? Well, if you look at the canvas, this is a huge canvas, first of all, and it's one that he painted, of course, in the springs, painted horizontally, unstretched and un primed on a piece of raw can, this cat, cotton duck, and, uh, and he walked around the, the canvas quite famously, and certainly, you know, the, the, there have been many documentation, uh, photographic documentations of him painting, but if you look at the painting, he actually really ordered the canvas in, in some very particular ways. First of all, um, the, the density of the paint is towards the center, and that there really is a frame around the That's edges, absolutely true. Um, so that he knew exactly where he was going and where he was ending, but at the same time, the density um, becomes most extreme a little bit more than a third of the way up the canvas. And in fact, there's a sort of a, a loose horizontal that's about one third of, of the way up the canvas, um, nice. which, which in some ways uh, functions to, I think, anchor the canvas and give it a kind of center of gravity that's low rather than high so it doesn't feel unwieldy. In, but the, in the classroom, if you take a slide of this painting uh -huh. and flip it over, uh -huh. the painting falls apart. Really? Yeah. I wish we could do that here. Your mention of the horizontal reminded me of a horizon line, which is a funny thing to think about because he's got the canvas flat on the floor. There I, is no horizon line. I was consciously avoiding the word horizon line, but I It's pretty inevitable association yeah. here, though, I think. It is, because we really do see a kind of space. It's the way in which those schemes of paint, those lines, really fold in to each other and become this incredibly sort of dense spatial tank. It's very powerful to stand in front of. It feels very enveloping and, and around one, even though one is standing separate from it. That's true. It. I want to go back to this idea, though, of his intent, because, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. His two sort of great critical framers early on, um, Greenberg. Greenberg and Rosenberg, um, had very different views on the way that Pollock, on what Pollock was doing. And, you know, Rosenberg very famously says that what we're seeing in a museum is in some sense just a fossil of the original work of art, which was the act of making. The performance. The performance, the performative element itself, right. Whereas Greenberg said it only became a work of art when it was lifted off the floor into the realm of the, of the vertical and sort of entered into this continuum of the well, history of it, art. It's an interesting thing because we're not looking at it the way that the artist himself looked at it and created it, which is probably an, uh, something that never happened well, before. Well, because of that, sometimes I'm, I find myself going to the edge of the canvas and cocking my head to the side so that I can see across the canvas the way that Pollock would have. So it's a very different experience. I wonder how those things, he kept both of those things in his head. He was very conscious of what this would, I think, he was very conscious of what this painting would look like when it did reach the vertical. Well, he must have. I mean, he was speaking to a tradition of, of painting, There was the one. Of there is one case, though, when he asked Tony Smith, uh, who put together some of his most important exhibitions, to hang a painting 
horizontally on the ceiling in a in, in, in a gallery in Betty really? Parsons. Yeah, that's interesting. And so there was one case when you actually would have looked across the canvas or at least up at it. You know, I'm looking now, and there are some people standing in front of it and and sort of pretending that they're dripping. And they look the, the figures in front of that net that dense network of drips and lines look so strange. There's, a, there's, there's something there's I don't some very know. famous photographs of Vogue models actually in front of these these canvases, and they look incredibly striking. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's, a whole, there's so many ways to, to approach this this painting, but I think one of the things that that I think is most important to take away from Pollock is that this is not a canvas that's about representing a vase of flowers, a, a human body. It's really a painting about the, that represents the action and the activity of painting itself. The gesture. This is about... The, the painterly gesture? And, and the act Except of making. There's, there's and the act of making. But yes, gesture, absolutely. But there's no paintbrush, which is the no. thing that we think about when we think about gesture. But, but think about it this way. When you look at any of those individual lines of paint, mm -hmm. they get thicker and thinner and sometimes they pool. When they pool, you get the sense that Pollock stopped and the paint continued to drip. When he, when his arm moves slowly, you have a thicker line. And when, he, when you have this thinning line, you know that he sped up. So this becomes almost a kind of choreographic notation where you can almost begin to re reconstruct how he moved around this. And so in some sense, it's a, it's a broader gesture. It's not the gesture of the brush. It's not the gesture even of the hand. It's the gesture of the entire body. That's interesting because at the same time, I can feel that, but at the same same time I feel a tension because it, it looks like there's there's some way that in its multifariousness and its density that it seems like a natural thing and not something that was made. And that's maybe tying back into the point you made earlier about us not wanting Polly to have been overly conscious. We want this to somehow be an act of nature. And of course, that ties in beautifully with this whole myth. There's that very famous moment early in Pollock's career when Lee, Lee Krasner, an extraordinary artist in her own right, and, of course, Pollock's wife would introduce him to Hans Hoffmann, the great German abstractionist. Hoffmann would say to Pollock, you need to look more closely at nature when, when Hoffmann is reviewing Pollock's early work. And Pollock is said to have responded, I am nature. Ah, interesting.